General Van Novos will be our <laughs> first keynote speaker, so we don't want to take all of her, uh, her comments there. But at this time, I'd like to uh, introduce NDTA's Chairman of the Board, Mr. John Dietrich, for a few welcoming comments. Mr. Dietrich is the Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of FedEx. Sir, thank you for continuing to serve as our NDTA Chairman of the Board. Ladies and gentlemen, the Chairman of NDTA. Thank you, Andy, and uh, good afternoon and welcome, everyone. Thank you all for joining NDTA and U.S. Transcom for our fall 2023 meeting. It's, it's an honor for me to be here and to be chair of NDTA. I look forward to this incredible event every year, and it's also great to see so many familiar faces. First, I want to share my personal thanks and appreciation to General Van Ovost, her command team, and staff for the critical service they provide to our nation. It's an honor and privilege to work with you all. I'd also like to thank you for your continued partnership as NDTA's co-sponsor. Our collective ability to bring together a wide range of groups from government, industry allies, and academic expert helps to build stronger relationships between us all. I'd also like to recognize the numerous individuals who make this week possible. It's not possible for me to name all of them, but thank you for your time and dedication. We are really well positioned for a great conference. As you'll see throughout the schedule, time has intentionally been carved out each day for networking. And as General Ovos just, uh, Van Ovos just mentioned, that's really the goal here. Please take advantage of the opportunity to discuss new ideas and continue to build relationships among the best and brightest gathered here this week. For nearly 80 years, NDTA has brought us together to share expertise, solve problems, and encourage continued collaboration. The generation of ideas and actionable service from this group have impacted communities spanning the globe during both times of peace and times of turmoil, exemplifying what it means to be an ally and partner. There is no more time for us to work together collaboratively than there is today. The security environment around the world continues to rapidly evolve. Every single group here has had to adapt to the changing geopolitical landscape over the last number of years. While the challenges are always changing, one thing that does not change, and that is NDTA's dedication to serving as a trusted environment to address the nation's needs in the fields of logistics, transportation, and passenger travel services. I've now had the opportunity to work for three great companies um, that are industry organizations, United Airlines, Atlas Air, and now FedEx, all who are members of this great association. With each of them, I have witnessed the critical importance of outstanding logistical capabilities and preparedness. From vital disaster relief to utilizing transportation networks to support our troops and our country, vigilant logistics Readiness serves to protect our nation, makes the world a safer place, and positively alters the lives of so many for the better. Although I just recently joined FedEx, I have worked together with and been a part of the FedEx craft team for over the last 20 years in my role at Atlas Air. And my shout out to the Atlas Air colleagues that are here today. I've long admired FedEx's commitment to using its outstanding global network when the, world's, when the world needs it most and when called upon in partnership with the U.S. government. This includes through the extensive work FedEx has done in the craft program, as well as its instrumental work distributing critical vaccines as part of Operation Warp Speed and delivering baby formula as part of Operation Fly Formula. And like my time at Atlas Air and like Atlas, FedEx is always there to answer the call. My hope for you this week is that you take full advantage of this forum and use the time to engage, learn, build relationships, and spark new ideas. There has never been a more important time for these discussions, and I ask that you just take full advantage. Enjoy the week, and I look forward to meeting as many of you as possible, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you.
Okay, everybody email Jack now. Okay. And Mr. Dietrich, thank you for your remarks. I know they're from the heart. And I want to say a big shout out to all of our corporate sponsors, uh, both corporate and individual members, and our university members who are, who are here today. It wouldn't be possible to hold this event without all of you. Okay, let's go. I've got about 15 minutes to do uh, 30 minutes worth of work here. You're re are you ready for the week? I hope so. NDTA and Transcom team has been hard at work over the past year planning and prepping for this event, and we're ready to go. The government is here, industry is here, the fo fourth component, industry, and this year our allies are here. This is great. Our NDTA committees and chapters are here. Everyone here is here, so let's see what you can do to look forward to, to this week. Uh, first, let me say the fall meeting continues to evolve, and we try our best to ensure it's impactful and meaningful. We look forward. We are the people that can deliver what our nation needs from our military services, our civilians, and commercial industry our fourth component. Together, we make up the Joint distribution, uh, Deployment and Distribution Enterprise, the JDDE. And we are very pleased to have our allies and partners with us today from across the world. Thank you for making the trip. Well, once again, welcome to Orlando and happy Halloween. What a great venue here. Thanks to the association and the resort staff um, that put this all together. Let's give them another round of applause. The National Defense Transportation Association strengthens our team of teams by enhancing cooperation, and it's paying off. I want to thanks again to uh, the chairman, John and Andy. Where'd you go? There, um, uh, our president and CEO, thank you so much for your indispensable leadership. And in line with the fall meeting theme of advancing power projection, it is critical that the JDDE, along with our allies and partners, strengthen our collaborations, seeking new ways to gain decision advantage. Today, I want to share with you what that means. And to do that, I'll unpack some current enterprise threats, how we're mitigating them, and, and some emerging challenges that we must face together. Finally, I'll recognize someone who epitomizes the spirit of this association. To remain effective in the future, we must adapt now while we have the opportunity to act. We must help leaders at all echelons preserve time and create better options, a decision advantage. Now, this concept is not new. This entire team has performed incredibly, and the thousands of people that you serve are grateful. But good and purposeful work is an infinite endeavor, like Simon Sinek said. And that endeavor is challenged in this decade and during this week as we are challenged to stay ahead. By accelerating change in how we provide precision logistics, by accelerating change in how we achieve a decision advantage, at or greater than the velocity, scope, and scale of the changing character of war, because that's what our adversaries are doing as well. This is our inflection point. As President Biden shared, we must sharpen our competitive edge for the sake of our children. The underlying might to, enter, to accelerating this change through the inflection point is all of us. The challenges posed by this. So, a little early. By, with, and through our commercial teammates, our allies, and partners, we are underwriting the lethality of our combined forces. So thank you for your active engagement as I elaborate on my vision and charge. A year ago, I shared a picture of the strategic environment from the President's National Security Strategy. And the recent disorder in the Middle East reaffirms this is still a decisive decade. In Europe and in the Indo-Pacific, Russia and China continue to undermine the international rules-based order through a changing character of war 
using gray zone tactics that threaten our global logistics infrastructure. These actions can test all of us. Home is no longer a sanctuary. It is a jungle out there. Now let's take a look. The challenges posed by the CCP and the PLA are complex. We require a coordinated response. Some fishermen have completely stopped sailing out of fear of being harassed by China. Philippine resupply boats and the Philippine Coast Guard hit with water cannon and subjected to dangerous maneuverings by the Chinese Coast Guard and militia vessels. China regards Taiwan as a breakaway province and countries that establish relations with the island soon find themselves at the receiving end of Chinese anger. Make no mistake. China is pressing forward with an aggressive modernization and expansion of their military capability. With the supply chain crisis putting a spotlight on ports around the world, China's outsized role in the global economy is front and center. The use of lodging at ports around the world could subject sensitive US military logistics to more surveillance by Chinese intelligence and military operators. But that's not all. Huawei is also seen as a cybersecurity threat to the U.S. Washington has accused the company of being a potential conduit for Chinese spying and cyber theft. The Polish authorities are investigating an apparent hacking attack on the National Railway Communications Network. Poland, which is a close ally of Ukraine, is a key transit for Western arms destined to aid its neighbor. The Kremlin right now is trying to turn the tide after months of defending against Ukraine's counteroffensive. Israel's billion dollar iron wall was supposed to keep Hamas militants out. Instead, Israelis were left virtually defenseless as fighters from Gaza swept through town after town. No water, no food, no fuel for generators, no medicine, nothing is getting in. The message that I bring to Israel is this. You may be strong enough on your own to defend yourself, but as long as America exists, you will never ever have to. We will always be there by your side. Gray zone tactics are changing the strategic environment. China's Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, is a familiar example. On the surface, BRI appears to be acceptable statecraft, wielding its economic diplomacy on the competitive global stage. 147 countries, which together contribute about 40% of the global domestic product, have signed on to or expressed interest in BRI projects. But we know that BRI is part of a larger grand strategy for political and economic coercion. Meaning, China offers low interest rate and zero cash payment loans in return for access and basing in the borrower's country, knowing that the borrower may default. Currently, eight countries are at risk from default, threatening their sovereignty and their economy. China's Maritime Silk Road is a subcomponent of BRI, used to assist China in expanding their maritime fleet for unprecedented access to global seaports. China uses it to lease ownership of ports globally, giving China access for its robust shipping industry. Now, as an Air Force officer, I'm pretty appreciative of Military Sealift Command making me an honorary mariner and introducing me to the distinguished naval strategist, Alfred Thayer Mahan, who said that naval power begets maritime commercial power, and control of maritime commerce begets greater naval power. This reminds us that China's BRI is giving them greater global reach, giving China their own decision advantage to execute their own precision logistics. But what is novel is how China is exacerbating the familiar gray zone tactics with the changing character of war. Chinese state-controlled companies are using port technologies to monitor and anticipate our logistics movements both at home and abroad. By gaining access to data, they gain an advantage that enables cyber attacks that can restrict our freedom of maneuver and disrupt our supply chains potentially causing physical harm. China's decision advantage is also found in their cyber capabilities, which are being used against all of us. Just last month, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency published an advisory with the FBI and China 
about cyber, a Chinese cyber actor called Black Tech. They are targeting corporate headquarters and subsidiary companies, exploiting their data and their systems with root access to routers, posing threats to the logistics enterprise. Cyber physical attacks, that is a cyber attack that can cause a physical action, can also affect our critical infrastructure, enabling China to disrupt our government services, power, communication, and water systems. This is not just a possibility. These capabilities have been a full display in recent years, with the Triton malware attack in 2017 marking a turning point for these kinds of cyber attacks. Triton, uh, they targeted the oil refineries in the Middle East, you may remember. Once inside the industrial control systems, it denied the use of safety controls to alert the facilities of dangerous conditions, presenting a physical threat from the cyber threat. All of this means that China can impact or influence logistics at the heart of our commercial industry, right here in the U.S. and abroad. China has also fielded hypersonic missiles, and Russia has actually employed their own in Ukraine. These long-range weapons threaten all of our ports, our fuel storage sites, our stockpiles, our warehouses, and marshalling areas. Additionally, mass drone attacks can overwhelm the battlefield and have caught the world's attention. From Russia using the Iranian Shahad drones against Ukraine to terrorist groups using them in the Middle East. The lesson here is that air power is now democratized by any power that have the means and the will to challenge us within our own territories. Now, China and Russia know that strategic mobility and power projection are critical to our combined operations. So they're preparing to deny, degrade, and disrupt all nodes through all networks. They know that our relationships are a center of gravity, where any friction between us can erode our trust and undermine our alliances and agreements, which threatens our cooperation in operations and activities and in investments, and threatens our ability to seize the initiative and integrate all of our efforts. Now, I don't want to spook you or anything. This isn't a Halloween horror movie. There is hope, but it takes resilient relationships to seize the opportunity. Difficulties mastered are opportunities won, Winston Churchill once so eloquently said. The threats against us may be daunting, but we know how to tackle tough challenges. We master difficulties and turn them into winning opportunities, something you've clearly demonstrated many times over the years. You've exercised our collective decision advantage to ensure victory, a decision advantage that is noble in saving lives and promoting our shared values and international norms, a decision advantage that improves our decision quality to preserve time and options, which encompasses anticipation and disciplined initiative to shape the systems, processes, authorities, and outcomes while we have the opportunity to act. Just look at Ukraine. It's been just over a year and a half since Russia's unprovoked invasion, and we have provided critical support across multimodal missions, showcasing the entire enterprise's flexibility. Now, these numbers only capture portions of the immeasurable work that you have done. Together, we've synchronized capacity and demand, allowing your teams to anticipate the requirements before they fully materialize. Yet we're still agile enough to respond to fluctuating demands, embracing the thrash, and ensuring the flow of aid is met at the speed of need. Thank you. And this past February, our collective response in Turkey and Syria helped millions after the earthquakes. More than 20 NATO allies and partners worked together and extracted over 1,000 survivors from the rubble. Our ability to respond to tragedy came from years of exercise and decision advantage, which laid that groundwork to shape systems, processes, and authorities. It enabled us to deliver hope and relief. President Biden recently elaborated that it's our collective values that make us partners and encourages each other to achieve such noble outcomes. 
Shared values and outcomes also include our ability to deter conflicts. Deterrence is most notably displayed during exercises, which are crucibles to reaffirm our partnerships. Exercises gives us opportunities to develop those insights and foresights to shape future operations, activities, and investments, further preserving those time and options when we need each other the most. Opportunities. From Ultimate Caduceus to Mobility Guardian, they've all certainly provided this. And your service this past year has been vital. So let's take a look and see how we have achieved decision advantage together. around the world who have benefited from your service. For some, it meant you saved their lives. But our ability to continue to this service during simultaneous global challenges in a world shrunk by growing technologies has arrived at an inflection point, requiring precision to be a new measure of effectiveness. We must mitigate emerging risks better and faster to stay ahead of this rapidly changing world, to tame the threats in the proverbial jungle. In the future, we're preparing for contested logistics to support a new vision for joint operations, the joint warfighting concept. This means that the joint force will have smaller formations that are partially autonomous and operate across large distances. We will need to provide precision logistics to su support their distributed operations while we face the challenge of fighting to get to the fight. In line with the 21st Chairman of the Joint Chiefs' perspectives, we must accelerate change through this inflection point and win. 
and we must do it together. That means we must rigorously evaluate innovative and novel approaches to old problems, seeking decision advantage at every turn. Like accelerating change regarding our warfighting framework, composed of uh, posture, capacity, command and control, and integration. Global mobility posture ensures that our forces, footprints, and agreements are resilient enough to provide joint force commanders the necessary ability to maneuver at will. Global mobility capacity comes from our multimodal lift platforms, including those from our allies and partners, and our emergency preparedness programs that allow us to rapidly scale to achieve our operational objectives. Finally, command and control and integration shapes our systems to reliably transfer data into knowledge and provide senior leaders with realistic options in time to act. Each one of these areas must benefit from decision advantage to sharpen the competitive edge, or we will forfeit the strategic advantage of our collective logistical reach. So we can't allow that to happen. Together we are advancing the application of decision advantage to the warfighting framework right now for our future benefit. Here are some quick examples. We're expanding the tanker security program to address requirements in the contested environment. And together with our allies and partners, we are seeking to optimize bulk fuel distribution posture across the globe. We continue to right size capacity of the maritime security program by the recent award of two more roll on roll off ships to the fleet. We're shaping strategic air capacities by focusing on developing the requirements for the next generation air refueling system and the next generation airlift program. We're connecting multiple platforms to sense and make sense of the battle space for real time command control and integration. We're protecting our cyber systems and the networks to provide mission assurance that our warfighter relies on. Advancement in these areas are how we achieve decision advantage in a rapidly changing strategic environment to retain our collective military's combat credibility. Speaking of combat credibility, there are other areas we're getting credibility in. Like the Air Force Falcons using decision advantage to triumph over the Navy midshipmen. Come on now. Now, Andy, I bet you, you mid, wish the midshipmen had a little bit of that decision advantage on the, on the battlefield there a couple weeks ago. But I know. Look, decision advantage is not retrospective. It's proactive, actually. It's anticipatory in nature. So, General Lawrence, it's coming. I think the Black Knights are going to need some decision advantage this, Friday, this Saturday, huh? Bring it! Now, just, you know, I was kidding. Teasing my Army brothers. No, not. No, not. Beat Army. All right, let's get back on track here. Foundation, foundational to credible capacity is readiness. Take, for instance, the U.S. government sea, uh, surge sea lift ships. In 10 years, more than 50% will reach the end of their service life. For this reason, Transport, Transcom supports the Navy strategy to recapitalize the fleet for readiness by acquiring used sea lift vessels. The Maritime Administration, supported by a broad interagency effort, has purchased the first five ships of our recapitalization plan, recovering our capacity by 1.1 million square feet in two years. Simultaneously, as funds are appropriated, building new ships for national strength complements our recapitalization strategy. Decision advantage is also extending into our new responsibility as the single manager for global bulk fuel a new mission that we're excited to lead and synchronize across the joint petroleum enterprise. With DLA Energy, all the services, combatant commands, the joint staff, and the Office of the Secretary of Defense. In the last year, we began to shape and scope global bulk fuel end to end from source of supply to consumption, partnering with all of you to bring integrated options to the joint and international force. But we need to get at standardizing executable contracting processes to command and control in a denied and degraded environment. We need to finalize scale rapidly and finalize console requirements, which is Richmond of fuel while underway. Patient movement is another area where capacity will be critical in any future conflict. Casualties in any large scale conflict will be heavy. Something we must prepare for. 
we project that the available capacity will not meet expected demand. A possible innovative approach is a commercial solution that mirrors our military capabilities in a framework similar to the Civil Reserve Air Fleet, but with civilian medical crews and equipment to provide that en route care. This framework needs continued discussion to refine the vision and ensure that our warfighter is cared for. Command control and integration across the JDDE can also be seen in our developing IT system called the Joint Transportation Management System, or JTMS. It is one of the largest non-weapon system IT reform initiatives in the Department of Defense, and it's laying a foundation that will enable end-to-end -end cargo and passenger processing with near real-time in-transit visibility, empower the warfighter with the flexibility to respond to dynamic requirements, and enhance the health of the Transportation Working Capital Fund by exercising greater accountability and auditability. This enterprise needs the capability as soon as possible. Finally, we need to go long, even further on decision advantage, like up into space. Space-borne velocity can penetrate the thick canopy of the strategic jungle, jungle and deliver unprecedented logistics. The Department of the Air Force's Rocket Cargo Vanguard program is developing this type of point-to-point -point delivery predicated on streamlined rapid launch approvals for airspace safety, supply chain integration to minimize time to launch, and the development of robust ground infrastructure. Another go-long example is the investment in small modular nuclear reactors for the commercial shipping fleet. It will promote cleaner fuel solutions while extending the range of port-to-port -port operations around the globe. Our countries are innovating at an incredible speed across a variety of capabilities, like 5G, electronic vehicles, artificial intelligence. But these developments need global infrastructures and international standards to become viable, like you know, simply EV just needing charging stations. So government to government and industry collaboration is needed to accelerate this change. Our collaboration is at the heart of acceleration or stagnation. Is at the heart of whether we achieve a decision advantage or not. So reach out now, start those dialogues to accelerate changes within governments and industries and in between them while we have the window of opportunity to act because that collaboration is needed to deliver tomorrow's success for our children. People, people with innovative visions, the passion to fulfill them, and fearless dedication to win are the ones who will help us achieve the impossible. So I want to take some time to recognize someone who's demonstrated these qualities. Mr. Mike Sacco is one of those people who have been critical to all of us in achieving the impossible. Mike is a true American patriot. He began his service to our nation 69 years ago and he enlisted in our United States Air Force. Afterwards, he wanted to get his feet wet and he joined the Seafarers International Union, SIU, sailing aboard U.S. flag merchant vessels. He's had quite an extensive breadth of service to SIU, serving at schools, divisions, departments, and the president of his home union. His last post was the president of SIU North America representing 80,000 merchant marines. Now those merchant mariners, uh, they are the power behind our service projection platforms. Without them, Transcom and the rest of the JDDE cannot succeed. And it takes strong leaders like Mike to rally them together when our nation calls, whether that's to promote and sustain economic prosperity or to deter aggression. So with that, I'd like to present Mike with U.S. Transcom's Pegasus Award. Pegasus stems from the Greek mythology as a representation of science, intellect, and understanding. Unfortunately, Mike is not able to join us today, so on this behalf, the president of SIU, Mr. Dave Heindel, will be accepting this. Dave, can you come join me on stage, please? Thanks. So I know that Michael's going to be watching. Uh, Mike, uh, you've displayed all these qualities and more in your service to our nation. Thank you for supporting 
the Joint Deployment Distribution Enterprise and U.S. Transportation Command and our mission to project and sustain the joint force around the globe. Thank you for your service and my thanks to your family for their support as well. Congratulations. Very good. Michael B. Thanks, Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Now, if you want to know where that trophy actually is, it is so large that I had to task my SDDC commander to send it door to door on surface, right to my to his house. All right, as a close up here, General Brown recently published his message to the force, and he reminds us why we're here. Our nation needs us ready to fight today's battles while preparing for tomorrow's war. And through it all, trust is the foundation. A foundation that will keep our formidable relationships strong. Something our adversaries fear. Our coalition and the broader rules-based order on which it's built gathers strength and trust through debate and tough discussions. Disagreements can look like weaknesses to the casual observer. But these discussions are what creates resolve, fortitude, and progress. It means that we have the respect and the willingness to listen to each other. So let's keep these relationships alive and do the hard work now to preserve time and options as the jungle grows. Our nations are depending on it. I trust in you and that together we will accelerate change and achieving decision advantage in this evolving strategic environment in this decade and this week. Thanks for being here today. Together we deliver. Now over to Ron Marseille. We got uh, several questions coming in for those that uh, are using the app. A reminder: that little question mark at the top of each uh, each event. That's what you push, and, and go ahead and enter your questions. So, ma'am, the uh, first question: What, if any, strategic gaps are your, are your top priority in supporting both the national defense strategy and what the combatant commands need to meet the immediate threats in their AORs? Yeah, thanks. You know, with um, with any conflict or contingency that's going on around the world, I, I, I look to three things. I look to my posture, I look to the capacity, and my ability to command, control, and integrate into what it is the, the combatant commander of the secretary needs. So I, I, so I want to bend it because it's important, right? Um, allies and partners, the access spacing and overflight um, that provide us that infrastructure around the globe, not just for U.S. Transportation Command, but, but for you, our fourth component. It's incredible, right? Like no one else can do this. We are the best at what we do in the world. Right? And so China has a big, a big maritime industry, okay? But they don't have near the kind of access that this team together, when we work together, uh, can bring together. So when I think about access spacing overflights, that continued relationship building, that trust, that partnership, that building that interoperability. Uh, so that's one of the first things I talk about with the secretary anytime we have something coming up is, where are we on that and how, how do we work close, closer with our allies and partners um, to support them in their needs uh, and to essentially expand and expand that team of folks that have shared international values. So that's foundational. Capacity is what always, everyone likes to talk about, you know, things, the, the ships, absolutely, you know, having the sea lift capacity, having the airlift capacity, as I mentioned, next generation airlift. Uh, next generation air refueling, there's some critical capabilities there that everybody depends upon okay, if, if we go around the world. And you saw your remarkable results in those videos. Uh, it's incredible. It's incredible what you're doing today uh, into the Levant, into the Middle East. Just, just, you just blow me away, right? But that capacity is finite. So again, building those relationships so that we can expand that capacity with commercial capacity when we can. But if not, ensuring that the the capacity that we do have is credible, it's ready, we've got the parts, and, and that we're, we're connected to the battle space. So that along the thing area, but that's all for not without the people, right? Without trained personnel that can get after the problem, that can operate the machines, that can be on part of these teams of teams. 
Uh, and so the training to get to what I call the, you know, the high-end training for the logistics fight, that's critical. We've got to provide the right venues. We've got to help with exercise, and that includes the exercise we've been doing with commercial partners. We have to expand that, right? Uh, and, and so doing that exercising is critical. Finding time to do that exercising is critical, but we have to make it a priority because it's not just today, it's tomorrow. Uh, we've got to be ready for tomorrow. And then on the command and control side, it's, and I talked about this last year extensively, it's cyber. Right? Uh, we have to have hardened systems. As you know, we do the majority of work. We, we press government data outside our own little locked-in Department of Defense systems. But we need to be able to do that. We need to be able to do it securely. So encryption, our ability to communicate and, and secure uh, government data. Uh, and, and so we have a lot of efforts going on within that cyber realm. I'm proud of a lot of the efforts. I think that we're working very closely with everyone, but we can always do more because the enemy is evolving in this in this terrain. Uh, and so we want to make sure that uh, that we're providing you what you need, uh, and that we're all being sensors for each other. You know, every every airman's a sensor, every soldier's a sensor, and this fourth component, you're all sensors as well. So when when there are issues going on across the network or with anything, uh, even in a certain country, we want to know about it and how we can help. Thanks. Afternoon, ma'am. With such strong convincing, convincing arguments of the maritime challenges that the PRC presents, how can you, how can we help you encourage our executive and legislative leaders to drive enough change to strengthen our own maritime capabilities for defense and economic resilience? Yeah, thanks. That's a very thoughtful question. Uh, I didn't know if we would have been talking about this three years ago. There were some canaries in the coal mine maybe 10, 15 years ago. I don't know, you probably know when, when about that would happen. Um, but now there are a lot of people talking about logistics <laughs> uh, and a lot of people that are concerned. So we, we do have a voice uh, now. It's stronger than ever. And I do start to see the coalitions coming together with respect to um, our maritime industry, which is an earlier panel on that with some awesome panelists. Um, and I know with Maritime, uh, Marad here is in, is in the house. Uh, but it is going to be where we have to come together as, as a coalition, uh, you know, across the government, industry, and our legislative branch to, to continue to accurately portray what the problem is and come together with solutions. Because you can't just do one thing. These are all interconnected. This is a wicked wi a web, a wicked spider web of things. And, and we have to come together with this comprehensive strategy for which we're in, in nascent steps to get a maritime, a national maritime strategy together. And then we have to agree, because it's going to take legislation, uh, it, it's going to take, you know, industry, it's going to be uh, regulation and standards, uh, it's going to take, you know, uh, us, um, you know, purchasing lift in different ways so that we can make a business case to be able to lift the entire community. But it's certainly, there's more than, you know, more than enough documentation out there about how our maritime industry is a bit lacking. We could see it with uh, long lines of docks, right? It takes us a while to get in. It takes a long time to get fixed. The artisans that are out there trying to fix our ships, um, you know, the, the actual labor industry with, uh, as well. Uh, so there's a lot of multiple things we can do. So I'm not going to say just build new ships because that's not going to do it. It's, it's pretty, pretty comprehensive. Pretty comprehensive thing, but maritime strategy is is a good start. But we have some momentum now. We can't really wait till the maritime strategy fully comes out. We need to inform it. So again, the the subcommittees that they get together to talk about it, that's really important. Thanks, ma'am. As you as you think about the global mobility requirement, where do you see our allies fitting into this web? Right in the middle. Uh, look, you know, um, our allies and partners have brought to these exercises, we have done aeromedical evacuation with them, we've done lift with them, we've done air refueling with them. Um, I'm, I'm seeing more and more sharing agreements coming out, so we are working to try to do more sharing to include surface lift sharing. Because remember, I think about, you know, uh, the military logistics network. I think about you, the fourth component. I think about your logistics networks around the globe. And then I think about our allies and partners logistics networks, right? And so how do we pull all that together to make one strong web of logistics capability that become, we, then we become more resilient, right? So we, we are seeing, again, increased uh, opportunities. I'm seeing it also with fuel. We're looking to see how we can 
with our bulk fuel posture around the globe, how we can partner more with our allies and partners uh, for fuel around the globe. I am seeing it in Lyft. Um, we are seeing some agreements that we have with NATO that we're sort of thinking about taking those kinds of agreements and moving them around the globe for shared types of lifts. Uh, and I think that that's going to be very popular, uh, frankly. But it does require that we continue to exercise together. Uh, and frankly, it's not just the lift pieces. I, I really do want, from a logistics standpoint, I want to be able to, and you see the pushes in the defense industrial base, you know, whether we can 3D print some parts overseas, whether we can have alternate manufacturing sources overseas, you know, how do we expand and, and become more interoperable uh, in, and in some ways interchangeable into the future? And that's what's going to bring us closer together, and that's how we can share things better. It's also visibility, right? You have to have the visibility of the assets, visibility of the needs for the different nations, and see who can come to fulfill that, to fulfill that need together. So I would say more agreements, but more exercises. We need to see the art of the possible. And I'm open to all new ideas of how we can share and integrate better. And let's bring them to the table. We got lots of exercises coming up. Let's give it a go. I really like the way this one was put. What keeps you awake at night? <laughs> what is the largest immediate threat that we face? Uh, you know, um, it, it's kind of unfair to say keep me up at night. I, I sleep pretty good because I have a fantastic, I, I, I'm such an honor to lead such an incredible organization. Um, but when I think about what, what I would want to fix the most and, and have the most in hand in is people. People. Now, people make the organization, you know, their training, right, their families. You see it in industry, you know, we're short and labor in different areas. I, I heard today that we're making up, some, making up some room on that. We're trying to make some room on that within the services as well. But it, it comes to the patriots that say, you know what, I want to serve. And maybe I want to serve in, in the uniform. Maybe I want to serve as a civilian. I want to serve part-time or full-time. Or just in industry, as an opportunity to get in there and design some things for the Defense Department. Because, you know, the, this, this is, we're, still, we're still an experiment in democracy here. We're still pretty young. Uh, and we want this experiment to succeed. And it takes people who are dedicated to serve. You know, people like Mike Sacco. People like you dedicated to serve. And I'm concerned that our children are not getting that flavor. That, that the compelling need to serve our nation in some way, whether it's Peace Corps or whatever, is, is not there. And it's up to us, you know, to continue on with that legacy and keep them, keep them going. Because I, I, don't, I'm, I don't fret about, about logistics and transportation. I threaten more about my nation. Thanks. And we touched on maritime and uh, got a lot of interest here from the air side of the house. Uh, the chairman talked about accelerating change. So we've had KC-135, we had the C-17 have been the workhorses of the fleet for years. Um, are you comfortable with how fast we're uh, accelerating as we replace these platforms? No. <laughs> okay, so, um, so KC-135 is a great airplane. Three to four square patchers, best squadron in the world. Uh, uh, and it's a great platform. It's got to be connected to the battlefield. And you can't just send up, you know, we're, we're trying to e execute mission command at echelon. It's hard to do mission command in an airplane if you're not really securely connected. Right? So we've got to provide battle space awareness. We've got to connect uh, our platforms. And, and the KC-46 allows us to begin those connections, but we, we can't stop there. Uh, so, you know, sure, what I've liked, everyone likes new things and more connected, more capability early, you know, got that. Now, this is, you know, this is, a, this is the long game, and we have the capacity. We just need to absorb it uh, and, and, and swap out as, as quickly as possible without losing the capacity along the way, right? It takes a while for units to swap over into new types of equipment. And the C-17, great airplane. It's a great airplane. Days. Uh, but there will need to be another C-17, right? Next generation airlift system. But for all of that, we have to describe what the requirements are, because they're going to be in some new ways. Because guess what? The C-17 you may not look like a C-17. It could be a family of systems. It could be autonomous. It could be small. Some small, some large. You know, we're doing some research on blended wing body out there, trying to understand how, how that would help us. 
right? So we want to be effective. We want to be efficient. Uh, so we need those ideas now. We know ideas from industry on how, how to best, as, we, as we're doing these industry days, to have these discussions about these requirements. You know, how, how would we best go about doing this? So we need your help. Because uh, frankly, you know, we, we have all these new authorities and we're trying to do some contracting that, that speeds the capabilities to the warfighter. Uh, and, and I see, I saw, you know, in, in uh, Mobility Guardian, man, it, we just MacGyvered it, man. Just here's a, here's a tablet and here's some stickies and, you know, in here we're going to connect to the, to the system. Let's see if it works, right? Did a lot of MacGyver there. But that's that beginning of once you give me that, now I know what to do with it. So we got to get capability into the hands uh, of our, our personnel so that they know what more we can do with it. Because we're certainly not the experts. The experts are the ones that are operating that machinery every day and operating the mission every day. So not fast enough. Uh, a lot of reasons why. But the eye on the ball is to make sure we have the capabilities we need. So we've got to have battle space awareness. We've got to be connected. And, and we've got to do things like protect our data, protect our signatures out there. Uh, because... Uh, you can't, you know, you, it's very hard to hide out there. You can be seen 24-7. Man, we've got a uh, kind of a global question here. With Ukraine going on, now Israel is going on, and you've got the Indo-Pacific, one of the largest theaters in the globe. Are we able to reset that theater with all the, the distribution and transportation that has to occur with every, everything else that's occurring right now. Yeah, I'll just echo the, the secretary. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. Due to your tremendous support, um, Ukraine is mostly being done right now by you, commercial operations, right? We've, we've standardized it, we're moving it around, right? It's, it's just going, it's just going. You know, uh, we have this crisis in Israel, you have huge help, you know, uh, helping us uh, get there. We start out with C-17s, and eventually it'll moderate into something that looks a lot like Ukraine, I suspect. But we're keeping our eye on the pacing challenge. We talked a lot about that in, in the speech. We are resetting our posture in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, that's, you know, whether it's warehousing, fuel, you know, where we, where we get our reps and sets. We're doing more exercises. All that's still on the table. we got to get that high-end training. So we... You know, there, we, we can surge in different areas and still meet uh, combatant command requirements. And that's all because we have learned, we, we have been shaping those processes and authorities and capacity just for these kinds of moments, right? I mean, we do a lot of planning in the military. We plan, then we replan. Plan for options. And you have provided us the time and options necessary so that we could surge C-17s for Israel. Otherwise, it wouldn't have happened, Right? And, and this is what I would expect around the globe. And we're still doing exercises, and we're using you heavily out in the Indo-Pacific, right? So, again, we can't do it without you, uh, and you're the reason that we can, we can take certain things and surge in certain areas. Uh, but we, are, we are absolutely have our eye on the ball out in, in the Indo-Pacific. And you'll see that more as we have more structured exercises, something called a joint force rehearsal, that we'll be doing out uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, with all of our allies and partners here into the future. Uh, so you're in high demand, and, and logistics has a seat at the table now, and, and I'm super proud. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm honored.